Well, today we're going to be speaking about happiness in a different sense, maybe, than you've heard it before. This is the morality of happiness. And the founding document uh, uh, we'll get to in a minute, but I thought I would give this message to everyone here at Mentone. This comes from Isaiah 46. I have cared for you since you were born. Yes, I carried you before you were born. I will be your God throughout your lifetime until your hair is white with age. By the way, it reminds me, my 20-something-year-old nurse came to me yesterday very concerned because she noticed a gray hair already in her late 20s. And I, I um, you know, didn't console her the way she thought I should console her. But uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, you might have a greater, um, uh, rapid, more rapid opportunity of being like Jesus. Because we're told when Jesus comes, what color is his hair? <laughs> yes, it's white as wool. And so, uh, and God will be us throughout our lifetime until our hair is white with age. And this is uh, something that all of us have, a, if we live long enough, have something to look forward to. I made you, and I will care for you. I will carry you along and save you. That is the message uh, for everyone here today, if you are willing to let God be your God. Well, the USA founding document talks, in our Declaration of Independence, talks about the, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness. Happiness. And, of course, I memorized that portion of the Declaration of Independence. I think it's repeated a lot, even in public high schools and schools around our nation. But I always wondered about this pursuit of happiness. Doesn't that seem a little self-centered? I want to be happy for me. And who does not want to be happy? But I would want to actually have you think about this in a different way because being happy is not really, at the core of it, self-centered. It's actually others-centered. So whether or not you are happy or at least act happy is about altruism. And it's about how we affect others' lives. Because you and I, everyone in this room, has a profound influence over others that we associate with. And I can tell you, running a depression and anxiety recovery program, it's no fun being raised by an unhappy parent. Nor is it any fun to be married to an unhappy person. Nor is it any fun to be a parent of an unhappy child. Nor is it any fun to be working with an unhappy coworker. Nor is it any fun being on a church project or mission with an unhappy church member. This unhappiness tends to spread and tends to affect and infect a lot of others. Our unhappiness or unhappiness affects others profoundly. And the research on that is clear. But what if you don't feel happy? What should you do then? You know, emotional reasoning, there are 10 different cognitive distortions that we teach in our depression and anxiety recovery program. And some of you are going through that program uh, now, and so you're going to learn all of those. But emotional reasoning is being carried away by our feelings. The problem is our feelings are not often based on rational and helpful thoughts. They're often based on irrational and unhelpful thoughts. And as we think those thoughts and then express them, we are demonstrating emotional reasoning. Emotional reasoning can, might, might make you feel better short-term, but it's going to cause problems long-term. 
I remember a popular song when I was growing up. I know I'm going to age myself when I state this, but it was, I think Debbie Boone was the, the singer, and she sang, You Light Up My Life. It was a love song. It sounded like a great love song <clears throat> until it got to the end. And the end of it was this. It can't be wrong when it feels so right. Whoa, what type of love relationship was that? Obviously, it was one that felt right. That's emotional reasoning. But it's going to result in pain. In fact, one of the things that's very clear is, in fact, this has been well demonstrated now. In fact, we even did studies on it. We, we presented this. We've had over 10,000 people go through on five continents now our, um, de our community depression and anxiety recovery program. So where there's a lot of statistics built up before and after. And <clears throat> we found out that those that are having sex outside of marriage, it significantly adversely affects their emotional intelligence. They're actually more likely to have depression. You think, hey, they're having fun having sex outside of marriage. No, they are less happy. They have more depression. They have more anxiety. Lots of problems occur. I think that's why God gave us the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. By the way, that's a commandment that even most atheists believe in. Uh, one of our professors has written a book uh, about what atheists and Christians believe on, uh, believe uh, together. It's called The Law and Its Logic. And most atheists believe that we should also not commit adultery. More Christians believe than atheists believe, but it's still a supermajority of atheists that believe that. But interestingly, the commandment does not say, thou shalt not commit adultery unless you feel like it. It just leaves it there. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And as a great uh, writer said, this is a Testimonies 5, uh, Volume 5 for the church, if the thoughts are wrong, what else will be wrong? The feelings will be wrong. And it's not what we feel that affects others, but what we say and how we act. And so we need to be very careful, depending on, you know, how, uh, no matter how we're feeling, is what we're saying how we're acting, and even what's on our facial countenance. Sometimes you can look at the facial countenance and realize there's no happiness inside that head. Well, when did unhappiness first come about? Does anyone remember? In the garden? When sin occurred? I think it's before that. It happened in heaven. Unhappiness in heaven. And the unhappiness, there's an anatomy that, that starts it out. You know, there's pride and then jealousy and then envy. And then it goes into malice. But always associated with unhappiness is murmuring. What is murmuring? It's an expression of discontent. And so, the, really, the author of unhappiness began to spread discontent. But interestingly, we were told this in Great Controversy, the law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all created beings depended upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. So the happiness of all the beings in heaven was actually dependent upon their perfect accord with the principles of righteousness. That's the law of God. By the way, it does set, state that if we follow Christ fully and are His and live, eternity, and live for eternity, we're actually going to be the Supreme Court justices of the universe. That's going to be the ones out of Laodicea because the ones of Laodicea are going to know what bad judgment is, and they're going to have it on them as well. And out of all people, those are the ones that are going to be the judges of the universe. 
And there's three branches of government. There's the judicial system, there's the executive system, and so there's also thrones going to be set up. But there's one thing that's not left to humanity, and that is the legislative system. The legislative system is by God himself. And although he'll be the ultimate executor and the ultimate uh, judge, he allows us to share in those other things. And that's because he understands what is needed for our happiness. By the way, every one of those commandments now, in secular scientific settings, this isn't the the time I'm going to do this, but I've given another talk on that, has shown that if we keep each of the commandments of God, we are far happier than if we don't. And the last one to be determined was on the Sabbath. And that study wasn't done until 2013. It was a a controlled trial of Sabbath keepers versus those that didn't keep the Sabbath. And, you know, the reason why most Christians don't keep the Sabbath is they think, I want to do what I want to do. And God wants me to be happy, so he'll be fine if I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. But the studies show is that if you do what God wants you to do, you're significantly happier than those who do what they want to do. (laughs) And so that's another avenue of taste and see that the Lord is good. He gave the Sabbath, the the New Testament says, uh, he gave the Sabbath for who? For man. He knew what we needed. He knew what was best for us, how how we could be healthy. Now, it also shows that Sabbath keepers can have bad things happen to them. They can lose their job, maybe because of the Sabbath. They can get divorced, maybe because they're following the Lord. But the studies show that if they're truly keeping the Sabbath, it doesn't get them down in the dumps. They don't go into deep depression and feelings of worthlessness and suicidal thoughts and those sorts of things. So the, the law of God is the aspect, those 10 laws. And by the way, it it, it amazes me how people complain and try to find ways that they can be happy apart from these 10 different laws. There's not a lot of those laws. If you're keeping those 10 laws, how many things do you think you can do? Do you think you can do maybe five things? Do you think you can do 10 things? Anyone want to give me a number? If you're keeping those laws, how many things can you actually do? You can do millions of things. Millions of things while keeping the law of God. And basically, God, because he gave us a frontal lobe, says, if you trust me to follow these laws, I can trust you to decide which of the million things you're going to do. (laughs) And many, and those million things, when we're keeping that law of God, do not have hooks. They don't have risks. They don't have downsides. So, and, and humanity always gets interested in things that have significant risks. Why is marijuana usage going up? It might make you feel better short term, but it can have a hook. It can cause psychosis. 10 to 12 times the risk of psychosis if you start using marijuana. That's why psychosis is going up significantly in our society. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson was very wise when he said, don't bite at the bait of pleasure until you are sure there is no hook beneath. There are things like lavender oil. Lavender oil can have the same benefits of marijuana, but no hook. It actually enhances the frontal lobe. It improves test anxiety, those sorts of things. But in these marijuana dispensaries, you won't see any lavella or lavender oil there. Why? It doesn't have a hook. And we're not going to dispense something that only has benefits. Uh, and so people will pay lots of money to walk this tightrope. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of fascinating how narrow-minded humanity is when they just keep going to these, uh, these risky things to try to feel better. But murmuring, discreetly speaking of your unhappiness, expressing discontent. And of course, the stated motive is always to improve things so that everyone can be happier. Is that what Lucifer said? Yeah, he said, I'm actually not against heaven. I'm for heaven. 
And I know that we'll all be happier if we can just do what we want to do whenever we want to do it. Let angels make their own law. We're holy beings as well. We can be the legislature. And we can make our laws for ourselves. And someone else can make their laws for themselves. And so this is the way happiness, we can get a much more contentment and fulfillment uh, if we are able to have not just the lawgiver be our legislator. And so he went around expressing his discontent. And pretty soon he got some people buying into his argument. He got angels buying into the argument. And even started the angel rights movement uh, where he stated that God was disrespecting the angels because Lucifer was not part of the council group in the plans of creating humanity in this earth. And uh, uh, and anyways, a lot of discontent happened in heaven and became such a discontented place that the angels who had not bought into it said, we can't have happiness if you guys are still up here talking about all this discontent. You need to go to another place and and, you know, uh, start living by your own laws and see how that works out. Notice that Satan is constantly seeking to introduce distrust, alienation, and malice. We shall often be tempted to feel that our rights are invaded, even when there is no real cause for such feelings. Those whose love for self is stronger than their love for Christ and his cause will place their own interests first and will resort to almost any expedient to guard and maintain them. This is your typical murmurer. This is your typical complainer. But, you know, in contrast, we have Paul and Silas. Let's open our Bibles today, if you have them, to Acts, the 16th chapter. Actually, it's, yeah, Acts 16. Let's just go to verse 19. When her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. By the way, if you are really going out there doing a lot of good, you are actually going to change how people spend their money. And when you start changing in a massive way how people spend their money, expect to be persecuted. People who sell things that suppress the frontal lobe of the brain, it's an easy way to make money today, Suppress someone's frontal lobe and have it be addictive, and you can make a fortune. But those people are always tightly connected with government officials. And so if their sales start to go down, they're going to come after you. And I can tell you, I won't tell you my personal experience, but I can tell you uh, I could uh, go into that aspect of things. So Paul and Silas were having such a positive influence that they were changing the economy. And they were changing it in a good way. And when the people who were actually being on the downside of humanity, they were worse, people were spending their money to worsen themselves, being manipulated by such, they actually took Paul and Silas, seized upon them, and notice what they did. They brought them to the magistrates, those are the government officials. They started to actually not tell the real reason why they were there, but they started to give distorted reasons why they brought them in. The crowd joined in attacking them, verse 22. Magistrates tore the garments off them, gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison, fastened their feet in stocks. If you read the book Acts of the Apostles, it was extreme torture as he tightened those chains about their bruised bodies. And they were laid not on a nice floor like this, but in an irregular dirt floor with rocks in it after their backs were laid open. 
feet are put up in stocks, and there they are crying uncontrollably in prison and saying, why us, Lord? Some of you are familiar with the story. The first part of the story is true. But what were they doing? They had happy looks on their faces, singing praises to God. Notice this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were what? They were listening to them. Notice this quote from Acts of the Apostles. It's up on the screen. The apostles suffered extreme torture because of the painful position in which they left, but they did what? Not murmur. Now, did they not murmur because they realized they were treated fairly? No. They were treated most unfairly. They hadn't done anything to deserve this. Of all people, they should have been complaining, it seems. What is this? Where is our religious freedom? Where is our freedom to just do the things that God has asked us to do? What have we harmed humanity? What have we done to harm anything in regards to the human condition? And now they're taking us and they're beating us with rods and they're doing all this. They could have started a major political movement, even there in the prison. They could have produced an uprising in regards to how these magistrates were treating them and probably had treated others. But instead, they had happy looks on their faces while they were being mistreated, singing praises to God. Now, the influence of them went up significantly as a result. Because after that earthquake, it's not just that the earthquake had happened. By the way, there was a, let's take a look at it here. And, and uh, verse 26 talks about the earthquake. All the doors were open. Everyone's bonds were unfastened. The jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open. And he was about to kill himself. And had Paul been one of those murmurers or complainers when that prisoner who had just, when the jailer who had just tortured them was ready to do that, he might have thought, yeah, go ahead and kill yourself, buddy. What you did to us, you deserve it. You deserve to die. Just go ahead and do that. But instead, Paul says, no, no, don't do that. I've kept, all the prisoners are here. We've, we've kept them all here. Don't do that. The jailer himself had heard him sing and knew that there was something different about these men. And as a result of the suicide being averted and seeing the facial countenance of even being, praising God in this situation, he realized I want to be like that. I want to be like that. This is amazing. What must I do to be saved? He says. And then he and his entire family were baptized. And then the magistrates found out that they had been very wrong. And so they say, Paul and Silas, get out of prison. We're not keeping you there. And Paul, and, Paul says, wait a minute, you don't just tell us that we can leave. You guys mistreated us significantly. And at the right time, he did say, you need to come down here yourself and release us. And they came and apologized and told them to go. And Philippi, as a result, became the first city in the world outside of Israel to have true religious freedom. Religious freedom did not start in America, it started in Philippi, and never again were Christians persecuted in Philippi. It's because of the emotional intelligence and happiness of the persecuted that made the difference. But it wasn't just Paul and Silas. Before them, it was Christ. Notice during his crucifixion, the Savior made no what? No murmur of complaint. 
His face remained calm and serene, but great drops of sweat stood upon his brow. While the soldiers were doing their fearful work, Jesus prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The mercy and compassion. There was no one more mistreated or treated more unfairly than Christ. But he did not murmur or complain. Paul, in writing the book Philippians, by the way, that book Philippians is written to the believers in Philippi, where there was now religious freedom. He said, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. He doesn't say, don't do things with all, uh, without murmurings if you live in a place where you agree with all of the laws and you agree with all of the governors or the mayors and you agree with the legislators and the police, then you can go without murmurings. He says, do all things without murmurings and disputings in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So one of the analogies to murmuring that I mention is bad breath or halitosis. When you're complaining to someone secretly or whatever, you're actually administering to them symbolic bad breath. And why do we brush our teeth multiple times every day? It's not just for good hygiene. It's to present good breath to others. And bad mood is like bad breath. Why are you inflicting this mood upon me? This is why we should act as happy as possible as often as possible. Isaiah 29, 24 says, They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. I'm here to say that I think it's probably fairly accurate that all of us in this room have murmured at some point in time. Amen. But Christ's instruction is that he wants us to learn doctrine. He wants us to be truly happy even in the midst of a perverse generation. God has shown me that he gave his people a bitter cup to drink, to, to purify and cleanse them. Why is our cup sometimes bitter? It's to purify and cleanse us. It is a bitter draft, and they can make it still more bitter by murmuring, complaining, and repining. But those who receive it thus must have another draft, for the first does not have its designed effect upon the heart. And if the second does not affect the work, then they must have another and another until it does have its designed effect. In other words, if you're murmuring and complaining about bad things happening to you, expect more bad things to happen to you. Because you need to learn. And it'll keep getting worse and worse. God wants us to quit this murmuring business. Amen. And we all have the capacity to control how we express ourselves no matter how we feel. I could give you some examples of that, but I've seen some very angry, disturbed people In expressing all of this, and then there's a knock on the door, and their facial countenance change, and they open the door very friendly. Hello. What? They had the capacity to control how they expressed themselves, no matter how they felt in that instance, and in many other instances as well. Abraham Lincoln <clears throat> said, we are as happy as we decide to be. And I think that's exactly what we should decide. And I'm here to encourage each one of us to make that decision today. Being happy is good for us, and it's what we owe everybody who is in our lives. Amen. Acting happy has another advantage, however. The happier you act, the happier you will end up feeling. It is true, feelings do have a tendency to affect our actions, but our actions also affect our feelings. And how we act influences our feelings more than our feelings should ever be allowed to influence our behavior, or how we act. 
I think that's worth saying again. How we act influences our feelings more than our feelings should ever be allowed to influence how we are acting, particularly when those feelings are the negative feelings that are unhelpful. Psalm 144 says, Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. We should never give to the world the false impression that Christians are a gloomy, unhappy people. If we present ourselves in whatever setting as being gloomy and unhappy, we are giving a false impression about Christianity to everyone we meet. And those people are not going to meet God face to face. We haven't met God face to face. The reason why is God in his mercy keeps himself from his radiance. We'd all be instantly radiated to death if that were the case. But the only way they're going to understand Christ is by meeting a Christian. And we should never give the false impression that Christians are gloomy, unhappy people. Today, however, we've seen the secularization of society. For the first time in U.S. history, only a minority of Americans are members of a religious body. They don't talk of religion or God, so they replace it with political issues that are worse up, such as climate change and gender trans identity. I took this from a quote from a researcher that um, actually published what he was doing and saying just two weeks ago. I'll show you the, <clears throat> the reference on that. This has led to the highest rates of depression and anxiety ever recorded in America. We now have the highest rates, highest rates of addictions ever recorded, highest rates of suicidal thoughts and actions, lack of meaning and purpose, fake fulfillments or no fulfillment in life, expressed anger and family discord. These are all at an all-time high since America was founded. Author and religious commentator Billy Hollowell states that Hollywood, the media, and universities typically all come from the same what perspective? Secular, Secular perspective, which has permeated society and given America's younger generation, Generation Z and millennials in particular, the false understanding that everything is about you. He described this as the my truth, your truth generation, which tells America's youth that they can decide what you think is right and wrong. Where does that come from? We just said where it comes from is Lucifer. He says, I think we're watching, what we're watching happen right now is people have been living this out. Generation Z was brought up with it. And they're hitting this wall and they're realizing, oh my, this wasn't true. This lie that you're the God of self and you get to decide everything not only is not true, it's not fulfilling. It leads us to dangerous places and there's no meaning. By the way, our Generation Z are making multiple choices every day that are just about them. Whenever they get on a device, there's a lot of choices on where they can click. But they're clicking all about what's for me, 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 all of these choices. And the studies show the more they're making those decisions, the worse they get emotionally and the less productive they become. And so Generation Z is starting to turn around, as you'll see. And it's because they've gotten so bad that they're open to other things. Desire of Ages says, it is the love of self that brings what? <laughs> Unrest. Abby Lobb from Asbury University stated, Generation Z is now what? spiritually hungry. If you look at the world and you look at what is going on and what Generation Z is facing, this is the, the current um, young adult generation and teenagers of today. I just think they are absolutely desperate for something other than what the world is giving them right now. And the studies between 2019 and 2024 studying the same group, Generation Z, shows that now Generation Z is ready to turn to God if they can see that Christians are truly happy. Amen. Even New York City Mayor Eric Allen said this recently, I'm very hopeful for this generation because they're not coming with a veneer of religiosity. They are coming and there's a genuine searching for meaning in life. There's a searching for why am I here? Where am I going? All these kinds of existential questions. And as a result, I think that they're finding answers as they explore the person of Jesus and the Christian faith. 
This is why at even universities, you've seen these revivals and things like this occurring. Generation Z is looking for meaning, and they are ready to turn for God. The book Radiant Religion says, those who are always busy and go cheerfully about their performance of their what? Daily tasks are the most happy and healthy. Eric Braverman, he's a neuroscientist who's been studying happiness for years. He's also from New York, says happiness comes from the interaction between inspiration and what else? Perspiration. So in other words, once you're inspired, it's time to go to work and perspire. Anything that stops humans from perspiring to achieve something inspiring gives a what type of fantasy? A false fantasy and an endless distraction from reaching your full potential. And this is why these devices are endlessly distracting and they're preventing anyone who's on them, who is surfing them for me, 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 from reaching their full potential. Ellen White says in that book, Radiant Religion, it is not wealth or intellect that brings happiness. It is true moral worth and a sense of duty performed. First Peter says, he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak what? No guile. No guile. By the way, that is characteristic of those that are going to make it through all of these crises of the world and live eternally in their mouth will be what? No guile. Let him eschew evil. That means to turn away from and despise it and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. After quoting 1 Peter 3, 10 through 12, Ellen White says in First Testimonies, those who have an experimental knowledge of the Scripture are truly happy. They consider the approbation of heaven of more worth than earthly amusements. They want to have the favor of God in their life, and they honor that much more than what event they can have an amusement with or what site they can go to YouTube and entertain themselves. This will be the closing aspect of my message here today. These are the words of Christ on the greatest sermon ever preached. Blessed. This comes from the Amplified Version. The Amplified Version tries to get, for someone like me who doesn't know ancient Greek or ancient Hebrew, by the way, I'm, it's wonderful to have scholars at Weimar that know those languages very well. Uh, in fact, we even have a, a Jewish girl that grew up in Israel who is, um, who's there at uh, Weimar and teaches modern Hebrew as well. Um, <clears throat> she knew a lot of people that uh, got decimated in the massacre uh, there that started the conflict. But <clears throat> notice, blessed, happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of your what? Outward conditions. That's what the word blessed means in Greek when you look at it. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Be glad and supremely joyful, for your reward in heaven is great, strong and intense. For in this same way, people persecuted the prophets who were before you. Paul and Silas, one of the reasons why they were praising God in that instance is that there's a promise that when we're in, fully in Christ, he will not allow us to be tempted above what we're able. Amen. And we're also told one of the greatest honors that God can bestow upon his children is for us to be able to participate in his sufferings. Christ was publicly shamed. Paul and Silas were publicly shamed. And if you are ever publicly shamed, because of righteousness, don't murmur and complain. Praise God that he counts you worthy to participate 
in his sufferings. Be glad and supremely joyful, for your reward in heaven is great, strong and intense. For in this same way, people persecuted the prophets who were before you. Fundamentals of Education has said, those who in everything make God first and last and best are the happiest people in the world. That may God what? First and last and best. Let us never lose sight of the fact that Jesus is a wellspring of joy. What is Jesus? A wellspring of joy. He does not delight in the misery of human beings, but loves to see them happy. Christians have many sources of happiness at their command, and they may tell with unerring accuracy what pleasures are lawful and right. And just a few of those reasons to be happy. You're alive. You're here today and well enough to be here. Are your needs met? By the way, a lot of people say, well, my needs aren't being met. And sometimes I have to ask them the question, how do you tell the difference between needs and wants? Ask yourself this question, how long can I go without this before I die? If it doesn't affect that, it is not a need. And uh, a lot of people get upset. It's actually because their wants aren't being met, but their wants are not really needs. I could get into examples of that. Are your needs being met? That the beauties of nature are things to be happy about. Even the rain today. What a blessing to have rain in Southern California. I thought climate change, you'd never see a drop of rain again. So I don't know what's happening there, but um, rain has come to Southern California. Uh, seeing God's love through his handiwork. And also be happy about the six days to labor and do all your work. By the way, that fourth commandment is not a ju just about the Sabbath. It's also about laboring the six days. Laboring for the Lord. What a blessing it is. And then the Sabbath day of rest, an extra spiritual blessing. We have the Bible. We have the spirit of prophecy to let God communicate with us directly. That's a reason to be very happy. Amen. Another reason is Christ died for us in our sins. And you can pray and talk to the ruler of the universe whenever you schedule time with him. And he won't say no. Jesus desires you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of truth, he calls the comforter. He wants us to have emotional comfort. And another reason to be happy is Jesus will soon be the head of the government. If you don't think you have good choices to lead the government today, be happy because tomorrow we will have the greatest government head ever. The merciful, just ruler the one who wants all of us to be happy and knows how we can get happy by fulfilling his laws. He will soon be the King of kings and Lord of lords. And as we focus on the scenes and realities of heaven, we can't help but have real reasons to be happy. And that's just a partial list. The happy make the world better and the unhappy make it worse. So what is the morality of happiness? It is a moral obligation to act as happy as you can be. That demonstrates your love to God and your love to every human being around you. So for a message like this, I think it's important to call for a decision. Perhaps you've been living a self-indulgent lifestyle that is now adversely affecting your happiness. Self-indulgence will eventually lead to significant pain and unhappiness in areas that we don't have any control over. Perhaps you want to make a commitment that you're no longer going to live the self-indulgent lifestyle, but you're going to live according to the health principles that God has made for us to be the most happy. Perhaps you've been murmuring and not even realizing it until I gave some of the definitions of murmuring today. And when perceptions of unfairness or bad things happen, are you willing to make the choice, I will still not choose to murmur, but be as happy as I can be and live like the child Jesus did and the adult Jesus did? If you're ready to make that decision, you are preparing to be the person that goes through the final crisis without guile, and the Lord will bless you with many souls for the kingdom that turn to him because of your happiness. Mount of Blessings 101. If you will seek the Lord and be converted every day, 
if you will, of your own spiritual choice, be free and joyous in God, if with gladsome consent of heart to his gracious call, you come wearing the yoke of Christ, the yoke of obedience and service, all your murmurings will be stilled. All your difficulties will be removed. All the perplexing problems that now confront you will be solved. So may this be your answer to God's call today. Dear God, I'm trusting you, O Lord, saying you are my God. My future is in your hands. I will live your life within me. And I encourage you to leave it there day by day in God's hands for the rest of your life. If you're wanting some of these slides, this is the picture you can take to download lecture slides and you can get it easier that way. May God bless each one of you. And uh, although I won't ask for hands or standing up to make this decision, I will ask you in your heart now to make this decision. Do you want to continue to murmur or be self-indulgent? Are you wanting to give up murmuring like Paul and Silas and Christ did? And are you wanting to live his life within you? That will determine your happiness in this life and your eternal destiny. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope and pray that this service has uplifted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that you personally have been drawn closer to him. If you have any questions or comments, please text us at 909-492-0738 or email us at office at mentonechurch.org. We look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.